Good morning. Good morning. Happy to see you here. And uh, Brother Philip and his wife, Sister Marilyn. Happy to see you. And Bobby's brother, brother. How is your wife doing? Is she okay? Yeah. I'm happy to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. I'm happy to see you. And, <coughs> and those who are visiting with us. And we pray that you will be blessed this morning. I am kind of perplexed uh, with the message. I think I'll prepare this message from Wednesday or Thursday. And <coughs> to get a uh, sad news of a young man who has passed and we rejoice because he dedicated his life to ministry to serving God and serving God's people and in the flow of his youth uh, cancer took him out cancer of the liver in the flower of, the, of his youth. And this is somewhat of a deja vu, I was saying, or I don't know, last time, last year, this time in April, a young man, he lost his life in the flower of his youth because of cancer. And you see, though worlds may be separated by oceans and seas, the same thing that happens to us happens to everybody in the world. And he's from Haiti and he died this year within finding out that he was ill in February. <clears throat> it took him out in April. And um, we are grateful and I am assured of God's resurrection, the fact that Christ rose from the dead on that Sunday morning, on that first day of the week, we also will get up on that great day. In the quest for evidence and proof, reverberates, reverberates through the corridors of doubt, sorry, particularly when it comes to the profound teachings of the Bible. Skeptics and seekers alike yearn for tangible validation to anchor their beliefs in the pursuit of certainty. The early Christians found evidence and affirmation in a remarkable place, the empty tomb of Jesus. The empty tomb of Jesus. And this morning we're gonna be speaking about the empty tomb of Jesus. I don't want to bombard you or stress you out about death. However, it's inevitable. But there is something about the empty tomb of Jesus. It might sound far-fetched. 
far fetch or perplexing, might sound obscure. That if you think about it, someone must have stolen his body or misplaced it. Because we are not used to someone going missing within three days of that person being buried. Oftentimes we hear that criminals have disturbed the burial ground of a certain person. Maybe throw them out of the coffin and take the coffin to resell it. I don't know if you've heard that. But it happens in my country. Oftentimes you hear that people are buried with all kinds of costly aware and ornaments. And they, someone sees it and are enticed by it and they go and disturb the resting ground for that certain person and take away whatever was placed on them. In Luke chapter 24 and verse, 16, verse 1 through to 6, Luke chapter 24 and verse 1 through to 6, uh, 6, in the pre-dawn stillness of the first day of the week, a group of women accompanied by others approach <coughs> the sepulchre laden with spices to anoint the body of their beloved, dearly beloved teacher. Their hearts heavy with grief, they encounter a scene that defies expectation. The stone, the ceiling tomb had been rolled away and the tomb itself stood empty. Amidst their astonishment, two celestial figures appeared, clothed in um, white apparel, delivering a message that re reverberated throughout the ages. Why seek ye the living among the dead. He is not here, but he is risen. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I want you to understand that this is not a fictitious novel. It is not a made-up story. It's not an Hollywood scene. It's not an act or play. It is something that occurs. I often told you and say that the gospel rests upon the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> is that if the tomb is not empty, then we are worshiping in vain. If the tomb is not empty, we will never get up on that great and wonderful day, <coughs> Thomas' confession, <coughs> the doubt, I, I said this last week, <coughs> about Thomas being doubtful, one of Jesus' closest disciples. If you ever thought that this story was fictitious, you see, Thomas has never read, heard, or seen anything of this sort. The fact that he captured news saying that they are seeing whom? The Christ. <clears throat> with all of Jesus' conversation with Thomas, you would have thought that he would have Listen and learn and understood that Jesus said he's going to defy death. He's going to get up from the grave. <clears throat> but Thomas, Thomas, that close disciple of Jesus, dissolved into resolute conviction upon encountering the risen Christ, his exclamation 
my Lord and my God encapsulates the scenic picture shifting and understanding catalyzed by the resurrection and acknowledgement of Jesus' divinity and triumphant entry out of the grave and the conquest over death itself. <clears throat> John chapter 20 and verse 28. The significance, the importance of the resurrection embedded within the narrative fabric of scripture. The resurrection emerges as the cornerstone of Christianity. A radiant beacon illuminating the path of faith unlike the secret sites of other religions enshrining the mortal remains of their founders the empty tomb of jesus christ of nazareth stands as a symbol of unparalleled victory a triumph over the finality of death and the hope of eternity I need you to understand this, brethren and friends. Men are able to dig up the remains of Helen G. White and Joseph Smith. Men are able to find the remains of Ailey Selassie. The first, Elias Selassie was an Ethiopian king. And that's whom the Rastafarians say that he is deity, he is God, and they base their religion off him. You should be familiar with Ellen G. White, who is the founder uh, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You should be Familiar with Joseph Smith, who is the founder of the Jesus Christ of the Latter Saints of Mormon movement. And you should be able, you should be familiar with the founder of the Jehovah Witnesses, who is Charles T. Russell. You can find their grave, but Jesus Christ is not in Jerusalem. You can't find him there because he got up from the grave. What does the resurrection prove? <clears throat> Going into the testimony depths of the resurrection, we unearth profound implication that go span on the contours of faith and reason, proving Jesus' identity. Jesus lies steamed with audacious assertion and divine proclamation, from claiming sonship with the Almighty to asserting authority over sin and death. His words resonated with the weight of eternity. Yet it was the resurrection that bestowed incontrovertible vindic sorry, vindication upon his claims, unveiling the truth of his divine identity in radiant splendor. Let us look on Jesus' claim. Jesus made several audacious claims throughout his ministry, challenging controversy conventional wisdom and asserted his divine authority. These claims include the identity as the Christ, the Son of God, 
Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 through to 20. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 through to 20. In verse 13 of Matthew 16, he came to the region of Caesarea of Philippi, and he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? They replied that he is some prophet or Jeremiah. But Jesus Christ wanted this answer from his disciples because he has been training them and teaching them so he wants them to be able to identify him with a certain deity, a certain nature, because the things that Christ do is, is not of any ordinary person. Christ's privilege and power surpass those of human understanding. And so he said, who do you say that I am? And it was Simon Barjoma who got up and said, thou, are the living uh, thou art the son of God and so Jesus said flesh and blood has not what revealed this unto you but my father who is in heaven and he said upon oh, this rock Peter uh, by this confession that you have made I will build my ecclesia I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. These claims, he was sent by God. Write these down, John 8, 42. These claims are one with the Father, John 10 and verse 30. These claims are deserving of honor equal to the Father, John 5 and verse 23. These claims are possessing authority to forgive sin, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2 to the to the six these claim are he is king john 18 and verse 37 these claim are lord of the temple john chapter 2 verse 14 to the 22 these claims are he's lord of the sabbath matthew chapter 12 and verse 8 these claims are lord of angels matthew chapter 24 and verse 31 these bold assertions were put to the ultimate test at the cross but the resurrection but the resurrection but the resurrection affirmed their truthfulness declaring Jesus to be declaring Jesus to be declaring to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. He's not in Jerusalem. You could search and search like all the archaeologists have done. They will never find his body. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, it's amazing. There are a lot of people who say, yes, and Jesus lived. But they can't find his body because it's not there. The authority of the words. The authority of his words and let us examine it. The resurrection is not only validated Jesus claim but it also conferred authority upon his words. His resurrection affirmed his lordship as he declared all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. This authority from the centerpiece of apostolic preaching as evidence in Acts 2 where Peter boldly proclaims Jesus as Lord and Christ exalted at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 2 32 to 36. We need to understand <clears throat> what the resurrection demonstrates. The resurrection and the empty tomb demonstrates power over Satan. I'm going to say that again. It demonstrates power over what? 
Satan. Beneath the earthly events, an unseen cosmic battle rage, a titanic clash between the forces of light and darkness, of good and evil. Jesus, in his death and resurrection, waged war against the ancient serpent, fulfilling prophetic promises and shattering the demon, the, the dominion of Satan. His victory proclaimed the empty tomb echoes through the annals of time, heralding down of a new era of redemption and restoration. Because if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you will see that the last thing that God has overcome is the sting of what? Death. It was Paul said, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Now, let us examine the prophetic fulfillment. And so I'm here to let us know that the empty tomb is evidence of our victory in Christ. It is evidence of our victory over death. God's promise in Genesis 3 and verse 15 foretold a climatic showdown between the seed of the woman and the serpent, culminating in the defeat of Satan's Jesus incarnation initiated this cosmic confrontation as he came to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3 and verse 8. Through his death, Jesus rendered powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, fulfilling the prophetic anticipation of Genesis chapter, Genesis, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, there is victory over death. Despise <coughs> Satan's relentless effort to trap Jesus' mission culminated in his crucifixion the resurrection marked the ultimate judgment of satan jesus triumphed over death and his subsequent exaltation demonstrated his complete victory over the forces of darkness through his resurrection jesus disarmed principles and powers making a public spectacle and um, spectacle of them and triumphing over them. Colossians chapter 14 and verse 15. Let me <clears throat> help you to understand the consequences of no resurrection. Within the corridors of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul confronts the chilling prospect of a world devoted of resurrection hope. A bleak landscape where preaching is shallow, faith is futile, and souls languish in the grip of sin and death. If there's no resurrection, there is no eternal hope. If there's no resurrection, our faith is on a shaky ground. If there's no resurrection, this gospel is in vain. And then my brother who have died yesterday, I would not see him again. Do you understand what I'm saying? That this empty tomb proves to us of the resurrected Christ and that we all will get up again. Soon God start calling me get up again. Right? It's like I'm saying that. I'm saying it with conviction. I'm saying it knowing, not if I may be, understand the empty tomb this morning. That we share a commodity because of Christ's blood. That because Christ's victory over death, we have this eternal hope. And we thank God for the empty tomb this morning. If you are not a Christian, 
There's a way to be identified with Christ. And you can put on Christ and all you have to come do is come here in this morning. Come believing, come confessing, come repenting and put on Christ as all the Galatians did in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 and verse 27 and become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Rest assured that the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 13 to 16 Paul said to the Thessalonians listen do not worry about those who have fallen asleep. In other words those who have died. Because when the trump of God sound, ah, the, the saints are going to rise. Those who are alive are going to change and we all are going to meet Jesus. Are going to meet the angels in the year. Paul paints a picture that we are going to change from mortal to immortality. And so... You and I have an empty tomb of great victory, great assurance. Yes, all these hospital craziness and all of these expectations of bills and all of the heartaches and pains and sorrows that we face, they're all going to be taken away and wiped away. In the crucible of faith, the testimony of the resurrection beckons us to a reckoning, a moment of profound decision. Just as Martha faced the probing question of Jesus, so too are we compelled to wrestle with the reality of his resurrection. For in that radiant truth lies the essence of our faith, the transformative power of a risen Savior whose lush lordship demands our allegiance and obedience. Please, church, Thomas was fortunate to doubt and then see evidence of the risen Christ to the point of his declaration of seeing the evidence, my Lord and my God. If you, Jesus has never claimed and said he is God. Now I want you to watch this, write down these two verses. <clears throat> Write on, get your pen and your paper, or sear it in your brain. Write down these two verses for me. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is led away and he is tempted by Satan. One of the temptations, three times he was offered goodies to worship whom? Satan. To deny his deity, his sonship, to give up his throne. In one of those temptations, Jesus said, I'll give you everything if you fall down and worship me. Jesus countered the offer by saying, only God alone should be what? Worship. Only God alone should be what? Worship. In the existence, Jesus Christ got up from the grave and he is about to ascend to the Father. Some of the apostles saw him. But after the resurrection of the apostles seeing him, place your eyeballs in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. Matthew 28 and verse 16. The Bible says that when they saw Jesus, 
Martha went to the empty tomb and she's perplexed because she's going there for one purpose and one purpose only is to embalm and preserve the body of Christ. But the stone is rolled away. There is no body. The Bible says that the grave cloth that is usually put over Jesus, his face is well folded and is laying on the place where he was laid. But there's no body. What does it say, church? From Jesus declaring that God alone should be what? Worship. And the apostles falling down after Jesus' resurrection and worshiping whom? Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And in no instant Jesus stopped them from what? Worshiping him. If you ever had any doubt who Jesus is, fasten your eyeball on Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is deity. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is God Almighty who came down in flesh and dwell among men. They worshiped him and Jesus never stopped them. Do you see that in your Bible? Why don't we stand as we sing the song of invitation?